Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Coming up on Market to Market, a first look at Acres is muted by an invasion. An anniversary of a trade war approaches. Pretty good. Now you found some strength. And market analysis with Ted Seifried next. Because we're really approaching some very key support levels. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, February 25 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. The Russian invasion of Ukraine became reality Wednesday. Airstrikes rang out across Ukraine as Russia targeted several areas. Now, globally, the countermeasure was one of economic response. The U.S. joined the EU in trying to starve Russia of international capital and key industrial technologies. For months, commodity futures trading had been influenced by the potential of an invasion as the global impact to oil, natural gas, and wheat were immediately higher before a sell-off on Friday. The U.S. stock market rallied as traders exited positions in gold and oil during the final session. Russia and Ukraine account for 20 percent of world corn trade and 30 percent of global wheat trade. And before the attack, an inflationary picture was building around the world. New home sales in the U.S. dropped 4.5 percent in January and 19.3 percent year over year. Builders navigated headwinds of supply chain strains and lost man hours due to COVID. Personal consumption expenditures jumped higher by 6.1% from a year earlier. This alternative look saw inflation rise 5.2% in the month of January. Orders for durable goods were up 1.6% last month as demand remained strong. Fertilizer prices have been rising over the last six months as grain prices have also climbed higher. Several state attorneys general announced the launching of a study into the more expensive fertilizer. Some of the gains are attributed to stronger demand as trade wars were waged. Josh Bittner reports as the second anniversary of the phase one deal has come and gone in our cover story. We're paying a 37% duty on our products while the rest of the world is paying a 12% duty. This week, a virtual town hall meeting hosted by agricultural advocacy group Farmers for Free Trade brought together farm state leaders, producers, and economic experts. Participants spotlighted ongoing tariff ramifications and called on the president to change course after four years of trade war brought on by the former administration. Tariffs are, are nothing more than a tax on Iowa farm families, and they put the livelihoods of our rural communities in, in the crosshairs. While some praise trade deals with Mexico, Canada, and Japan under Trump and chastised the current White House for leaving key USDA positions unfilled, critics noted recent reports of the shortcomings of the 2020 Phase 1 trade deal with China. The long-term implications are, are what we're facing now and, and are much more detrimental. And one of those that I think about most is, is market share. While phase one may have fallen short due to pandemic and alleged dishonest brokering by Beijing, some stakeholders say diplomatic miscues, like Trump abandoning the Trans-Pacific Partnership, have allowed Chinese regional influence to grow and inhibit potential U.S. farm export markets. At the same time, retaliatory tariffs gave competitors like Brazil and Argentina a window to bump up acres. That acreage isn't going to go away. It, it will never go back to rainforest. It will never go back to Cerrado. It will ne never go back to uh, grazing land. It's, it's always going to be farmed now. While economists say tariffs have had a modest but real effect on inflation, another area of ongoing concern is fertilizer. 
You don't want to look at what is causing inflation in your food prices. Start by looking at the actions of few, a few companies in the fertilizer business to restrict trade and the competitive supply of much needed crop inputs. Processors cite tariffs, domestic turmoil, and consolidation abroad, particularly in Russia, for rising fertilizer costs. Pundits warned this week's Russian invasion of Ukraine, a regional agricultural power, could cause energy and farm input costs to skyrocket. But some financial analysts see an interim silver lining as the incursion could blunt Ukrainian supply, dealing domestic wheat and corn producers price spikes and an opportunity to mend trade relationships with China. But for now, all eyes are on the Biden administration's next move. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. The USDA's Ag Outlook Forum is usually a market mover as the government agency releases estimates of the coming production year. 2022's reaction was muted as global events were unfolding almost simultaneously. Peter Tubbs has our story. On Thursday, the USDA released their commodity outlooks for the coming year, and the expectations are mixed. Corn acres are predicted to decline slightly due to high input costs and lower profitability compared to other crops. Improved yields are anticipated as how the industry will overcome the acreage drop and create an increase of 125 million bushels in output and hit 15.24 billion bushels, a 1% gain over 2021. High crush demand and drought conditions in South America will add 3 million soybean acres. Yield growth is expected to produce a crop of 4.5 billion bushels, also 1% larger than 2021. A tight stocks-to-use ratio is expected to add 1.3 million wheat acres to the nation's plantings. Responding to a dry summer, the wheat crop could be 18% larger than 2021 at 1.9 billion bushels. Higher supplies are expected to push prices down for all three crops over the course of the year. The USDA sees 17.6 million bales of cotton to be harvested in 2022, an increase of 3 million bales from 2021, but below the four-year average. Cotton will be planted on 9 million fewer acres, a decrease of 7%. The USDA sees a fractional decline for red meat and poultry production in 2022, the first decline for the sector since 2014. Tighter supplies of cattle are expected to support fed steer prices. The size of the nation's cattle herd is estimated to decline for the fourth consecutive year. Pork exports are expected to decline in the coming year, bringing lower prices for slightly smaller production. For Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. Next, the Market to Market Report. The volatility of Russia's move on Ukraine gave trading limits a workout. For the week, the nearby wheat contract was up 56 cents or 7 percent, while May corn improved 3 cents. Soybeans rallied to 2012 highs before testing the $16 support level on improving South American weather. The May soybean contract lost 19 cents. May meal shed $3 per ton. May cotton shrank by 253 per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, March, class three milk futures fell by 45 cents. A down week in the livestock sector, April cattle dropped 395. April feeders cut 610, and the April lean hog contract declined 572. In the currency markets, U.S. dollar index gained 65 ticks. April crude oil added $1.50 per barrel. COMEX Gold dropped 410 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index increased six points to finish at 649 even. Joining us now to provide some insight is Ted Seifried. Hello, Ted. Hey, Paul. So, we start the program talking about Russia and Ukraine. It is the story that is encompassing lots of world events. We've been talking about this story on this program for months. We've seen a buildup in the market but the question still is, what is the big implication of this invasion have on commodities as a whole? Yeah, uh, you know, and that's really kind of what the market's trying to figure out. Now, you know, you look at uh, what Russia is the number uh, 
what, two wheat exporter, Ukraine's the number three, Ukraine's the number four corn exporter. So, I mean, there's a lot of grain that comes out of the Black Sea area. However, you know, a lot of the grain that comes out, everything that comes out of the Black Sea, almost everything that comes out of uh, the Black Sea area goes to countries that don't typically do business with us anyways um, and are also countries that would not really follow along with sanctions if we were to place sanctions on the grain coming out of Russia. So uh, really it comes down to what happens with the ports. If the ports are shut down and there is no movement coming out of it, you take away, you know, 22% of the exportable uh, wheat supply. Creates so, an opportunity for somebody else. Is what so you're that, you know, creates demand displacement and ultimately makes things higher. But that's really the bottom line, is if the ports are absolutely shut down, whether they're destroyed or just unable, and, and that, ha that has happened, that did happen. Uh, but I, I think the market's looking at that as being a very temporary thing. Uh, I think ultimately it will be a very temporary thing. You saw a ton of volatility happening, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, sharply higher than sharply lower. Uh, and I think the sharply lower on Friday was for two reasons. One, you have this idea that, okay, you know, these, the ports and whatever, that will come, that will come back and probably in a, in a fairly reasonable time frame. But more than anything else, you have China Russia's biggest ally saying, you know what, Russia, you should probably not do this. I mean, they're not condoning this. They're saying that this is not. In fact, they, some of their, uh, they took some action on some of the Russian banks as far as their agricultural purchases. So without China's support, you, you, the market was getting the feeling that maybe this isn't uh, really going to be a complete takeover of Ukraine. And, you know, it really kind of contradicts some of what we were seeing in the headlines, but I mean, there's just a very big question mark about how this is going to end up. Um, I will say this though, a lot of this has to do with money flow. Like I said, from an ab absolute grain fundamental, I don't think we should have rallied as much as we did. And therefore taking a lot of that back on Friday made a lot of sense to me, but that was conflict on, right? You know, we talk about risk on, or we talked about flight uh -huh. to quality. I gotcha. I'm gonna say conflict on. There's a whole subset of traders and, and you know, traders in general too that look for these sort of unfortunate events, right? And then they look for ways to profit on them. You know, that started really with 9-11. But they look at and say, okay, Russia's invading Ukraine. Well, how do we make money off of that? The Ukraine exports a lot of grain. We gotta come in and buy a whole bunch of grain. And I, I believe there was a whole lot of funds that maybe don't typically play in commodity markets or grain markets that were coming in and very aggressively buying based on the conflict. And then they also say, well, you know, if the rest Western nations start sanctioning Russia, what does Russia export? Well, that's crude oil. So then crude oil was flying. But then, you know, that conflict trade starts to fade away and you have this big vacuum because a lot of that run up was caused just by those, those that, that money coming into the market. And again, when it fades away and these guys don't feel like they need to be in that trade anymore, it all goes away in a hurry. Uh, okay, so let's specifically discuss wheat because that's the biggest, we'll say, winner of the week mm -hmm. when it comes to price. Uh, is it all attributed to Russia, Ukraine, or is this drought story starting to take root? Yeah, so <laughs> something that happened this week is that we pushed all of the grain fundamentals to the wayside, right? Whether it's wheat, corn, soybeans, doesn't matter, but before this, before this really kicked off midweek, you had the wheat chart really holding very key support of the 200-day moving average with an inverted head and shoulders formation. It had a really good looking chart and really looked like it had some upside potential. And then we needed a spark, but we got more than we needed from a spark. And that spark really sent us sharply higher, probably a lot more so than we needed to do in, in the short run. Like I said, I, I think we over-factored in a lot of things, a lot of the Russia-Ukraine situation across the board. But no, I think wheat, even without, if this hadn't happened, and I wish it hadn't, I mean, from a humanitarian perspective, obviously, but the grains as a whole, I think we're operating under some pretty bullish fundamentals before this happened. And without it, I think we would have been doing the things that we were doing, just maybe not in that time frame, and certainly not for that reason. But that just really accelerated a whole lot of things. And again, I thought wheat had some upside potential before Russia invaded the Ukraine. We have the July wheat 
chart up right now and you can see that blip at the end as you're looking at the deferred month right now what are you doing from a position standpoint oh gosh i mean i you had to buy some puts in the last you know couple of days there's uh, thursday and friday i when you have that sort of movement based on news related things like this i mean selling futures is a very scary thing to do cash pricing is one thing you know uh, but, you know, I was really advising people to buy some puts fairly aggressively. What were you doing in corn? <sighs> you know, as we know, as we've talked about, I'm, I'm longer term bullish in corn. In fact, I think corn is going to be the big bullish story that nobody's seeing right now. Uh, you know, everybody's been focused on soybeans. But I look at that second season Safrinic corn crop, 86 million metric tons that we're just expecting to be there. And we're expecting it to be there in a, a La Nina growing season in a climate where input costs are so very high, I really wonder how much or how aggressively the Brazilians are going to push that second season corn crop. And what if it's not 86? What if it's 78? What if it's 76? What if it's closer to last year, which was 60 million metric tons? If that happens, that will leave a massive hole in the global production, and that will bring a lot more exports to us, both for this year and for next year. And all of a sudden, we've got some really tight corn balance sheets for this year and next, and, and we can start talking about having to price ration corn like we are for soybeans. So what I've been talking about, and the, the name of the, the, or the mantra has been, let's make cash sales, but let's reown those bushels. Because in the inflationary environment that we're in, in an acreage battle where corn is fighting with soybeans traditionally, but not just soybeans this year, it's everything. Anything you put in the ground is profitable. And you've got you know the Ukraine and, and, and Russia deal. There's so many bullish things that are, are, are happening. It's a powder keg out there. I think very easily we could see corn prices go sharply higher. And we did, midweek. Right. So ask me about those midweek prices. How often do we see our highs of the year in January or February? It's extremely rare. So now we have some really high, high watermarks to gun for going into the growing season when it becomes more volatile, which brings in Phil from uh, Dresden, Ontario's question, which I came know. in. And there was a good uh, back and forth about this one. And he's asking, with crop prices at high levels as war wages, how do you combat letting emotions impede your pricing decisions? Yes. Way to use the play on words there, Phil. I really liked the question. Uh, yeah, so I mean, that's always what we're trying to do is we're ta taking the, the emotion out of marketing, right? And whether we're doing that in a 20 cent range or a $2 range, you know, this is what we're working to do. And the way we always work to do it, and a lot of people don't agree with this strategy, which is the strategy that I use a lot, is I will reown bushels with calls because that makes it easy to set price targets and leave them. Not pull them last second when you think, oh, that might get hit, I could get more. Well, okay, but we already have a strategy in place for you to continue to get more, to continue to participate in, in upside potential while still laying off the risk and doing the right things that you should be doing for your marketing decisions. And the back and forth that happened on Twitter from our friends uh, at Naomi Bloom's firm, and it might have been Naomi on the, the tweet, was you have to prepare yourself for the high, the low, and the middle. Yeah. Is that what you're saying too? I Look, I... When you have profitable prices that we have right now, you never know where the middle is, right? So you can't say, I'm going to sell the middle because you, you don't know if you're selling the middle. You don't know if you're selling the top. Sure. I could say right now you're probably not selling the bottom. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you, you kind of have to look at your profitability and you have to make the sales where you know you're profitable. And we know we're profitable in most, area, in most places. So let's be making those sales but again we want to participate in upside i think if there was ever a time to come and reown bushels because of the explosive upside potential that we have with inflation and global unrest and acreage battles and, and demand you want to replace those in my opinion you really want to re replace those bushels so that you can continue to to participate in that profit because hey let's be honest if we're if we're fighting with our neighbor farming is competitive all right if we're fighting with our neighbor over rents next year, it's going to make a difference if I made an extra 20 cents on my corn bushel. Sure. All right, let's quickly get in beans. But We've kind of been talking about a lot of the same factors that at play. Was this a lot of profit-taking late in the week? A lot of profit-taking. Again, the Russia-Ukraine thing had very little to do with beans aside from sunflower oil. So soybean oil was certainly very strong. But, you know, beans have had a whole lot of reason to rally well before this even started. And, you know, look at export sales continue to roll on at a very strong pace at a time of year where we wouldn't expect that to happen. If we continue to make export sales like this, both for new crop and old crop, we're gonna we're gonna talk about, you know, a 350, 325 million bushel carryover. That's, we're, we're, 
chipping away at that in a hurry, right? So at some point we might have to price ration soybeans and we're not gonna do it in the crush because the crush margins are really very profitable at, this point, at these high prices already. Global exports don't seem to be slowing down. So if we do have to price ration soybeans in an inflationary climate, in an acreage battle, things could get very, very interesting. And some of the wild high numbers that we've heard from other analysts that have been on the show recently. Very recently. <laughs> Hi, Sue. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not saying that, I, I mean, most of us think that these are, are some, uh, well, no comment on Sue. Uh, but some really high prices are possible in this environment. Some prices that most people would think are, are ridiculous are possible in this sort of environment. So you want to have, you want to have uh, an, a window to that. You want to have yeah. a, a possibility of attaining that, but you still have to make your cash sales because look at what happened on Friday. Look what happened Thursday and Friday. I mean, you're going to drop $2 in soybeans. <laughs> well, right. well, let's move over to livestock because they too have been feeling the hammer of an up and a down. Right now they end the week down live cattle specifically. We were at some highs just a couple of sessions ago, and what's what's beating them up now? Uh, well, you know, risk off, right? I mean, you had a lot of that happening. Money flow was the name of the game this week, you know. Um, and as far as cattle were concerned, we were kind of at a point where we were sort of consolidating up near highs. It had to make a decision, higher or lower. And with everything that happened there, with everything that transpired this week, lower was the easiest path of resistance for the end of the week when you have speculators that are unsure about things, they want to move out of the way. And when you have turbulence in the stock market, live cattle, you worry about demand and things like that. I, am, I have no worries about beef demand in this country going forward. Export demand is always questionable. Uh, I think we needed a correction. I think we'll find our footing. I think we'll start to come back. Cattle on feed wasn't tremendously bearish in my opinion. Um, feeder cattle, I think, look interesting. They needed to come off because of the strength in corn midweek, but then look at what happened in corn on Friday. So, you know, let's see how, feeder, how feeders respond, respond to that early there. next week. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, when you get to, to hogs, right? I mean, for a very long time, the hogs, I think, had been undervalued. We had a lot of weight up front, and that was, was really holding us back at the end of the last calendar year into the early part of this year. And then we started to rally, and the speculators really took note of that and liked the chart and started buying hogs too. And I think we may have kind of extended a little bit further to the upside than maybe we needed to. So having a correction later this week, uh, you still you look at a chart, you still it still looks pretty good. I don't know if we need to go make new highs in lean hogs, but I do think we'll find some footing and start to bounce back as long as the markets are a little bit more stable next week. You know, I mean, if we're just trading headlines again like we had been this last week, then all bets are off. Well, the, the matter of trading headlines, I mean, that sometimes has what's gotten us to this point yeah. and not the study of the fundamentals or the technicals. Well, absolutely, Paul. And, and, you know, if we've learned anything at all in the last four or five years is that things can and will happen, and apparently at a very ferocious pace. Uh, so, you know, when we talk grains, we like to trade weather. We like to trade whether China's buying and things like that. Not necessarily global pandemics, aside from mm. potential World War III or a second Cold War. But these are things that we have to, have to trade. And that all brings us back to the idea of marketing and making the sales where you need to make your sales because things do and, happen. And I'll make uh, another sale of you for more questions in a moment. Thank you, Ted. Thanks, Paul. All right. That will do it for this installment of Market to Market, the TV show. We will keep talking in the online version we call Market Plus. Find that on our website of markettomarket.org. We are entering the time when public TV stations like this one are asking for your support. We may also be airing in different time slots to accommodate changes in the schedule. If you value the work of this program and your station, please consider making a gift of support right now. Next week. We take a look at the bottlenecks that continue to squeeze the supply chain. Thank you for watching. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, 
For over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.